Hi, I'm Peg Sanders from the NIH Office of Human Subjects Research Protections, and we'll be talking today about the role of the Institutional Review Board in the protection of human research subjects. This session is intended to help viewers understand the role of the IRB, which I will refer to in this presentation, in the protection of human research subjects by improving their ability to identify the following. Part one, the ethical and regulatory basis for research review in the United States. Two, purpose and function of the Institutional Review Board in the informed consent process and associated regulatory requirements. And part three, risk and benefit assessment by the IRB, an IRB review process and criteria for approval. Let's first address the ethical and regulatory basis for research review in the United States. Research versus clinical practice. The following is a selection of notable time points in the history of human subjects research that have informed our current regulations and is not intended to be a complete list. The Nuremberg trials were carried out from 1945 to 1949 and included among others, the Nazi doctor's trial from 1946 to 1947. The Nazi doctor's trial resulted in the Nuremberg Code. This was the legal and ethical code that arose from the Nazi war crimes tribunal of 23 Germans, of whom 20 were physicians, who were indicted for their willing participation in the system systematic torture, mutilation, and killing of prisoners in experiments. Among others, these included high altitude experiments with a low pressure chamber, which simulated altitudes of up to 68,000 feet. In this experiment, 80 of the human subjects died after be being kept inside for half an hour without oxygen. Freezing experiments were also conducted and subjects were submitted to submersion in freezing tanks with an average water temperature of eight degrees Celsius. Additionally, experiments were conducted with other agents such as malaria, mustard gas, intentional poisoning, as well as bone muscle and nerve regeneration studies and bone transplant experiments. A 10-point statement of rules designed to protect the rights and welfare of research participants. The Nuremberg Code first principle was the requirement of voluntary, competent, informed, and comprehended consent. And it remains the most critical contribution to both international and US law and ethics. Another document related to the conduct of clinical research is the Declaration of Helsinki drafted by the World Medical Association as the first international agreement recommending ethical standards for clinical research and that had a distinct guidance for consent. The Guatemala syphilis study was led by the US Public Health Service, is funded by a grant from the NIH and involved multiple Guatemalan government officials. Doctors infected soldiers, sex workers, prisoners, and psychiatric patients ranging in age from 10 to 72 years old with syphilis and other sexually transmitted diseases without obtaining consent, and then treated some of the subjects with antibiotics. Researchers paid prostitutes infected with syphilis to have sex with prisoners. This resulted in 83 deaths. The goal of the study seemed to have been to determine the effect of penicillin in the prevention and treatment of venereal disease. The MK Ultra project took place in the 1950s and was the code name given to a CIA run human experiment where prisoners and unwilling subjects were administered hallucinogenic drugs such as LSD in an attempt to develop incapacitating substances and chemical mind control agents that could be used to weaken individuals and force confessions. Additionally, electroshock, hypnosis, sensory deprivation, and other forms of torture were utilized. The Willowbrook study also took place starting in the 1950s at the Willowbrook State School in Staten Island, New York. At that time, it was the biggest state-run institution for people with mental disabilities in the United States. The purpose of the research was to discover a hepatitis vaccine, and the research involved 700 students some of whom were mentally disabled children who were intentionally infected with viral hepatitis. 
Concern also related to the lack of full disclosure of research risks to the parents who were providing permission for their child to participate. There was also the issue of possible coercion. When the schools became too crowded, school officials told the parents there was only space in the separate hepatitis research building, which could have influenced the decision of some parents who did not have the resources to otherwise care for their children. Dr. Chester Southam was an immunologist whose research was quite controversial. He was interested in seeing how healthy and sick individuals responded to the subcutaneous injection of cancer cells. Between 1962 and 1963, 22 elderly chronically ill and debilitated patients at Brooklyn's Jewish Chronic Disease Hospital were injected with living cancer cells without written consent and without being told that the interventions were live cancer cells. This research was actually funded in part by the US Public Health Service. Prior to that, 300 other patients at the Sloan Kettering Institute for Cancer Research and Memorial Hospital for Cancer and Allied Diseases had also participated in this work, and many of them similarly had not been told that the injections contained living cancer cells. In 1956, Southam tested healthy inmates of the Ohio State Penitentiary in Columbus, Ohio, who volunteered for the test, although they knew that the injections contained cancer cells. Under federal research regulations put in place since that time, prisoners are considered a vulnerable population as a result of the potential for coercion or undue influence in the consent process. And federal regulation for human subjects research includes special protections for prisoners. The straw that broke the camel's back was the egregious conduct of the US Public Health Service Tuskegee syphilis study. It began in 1932 when the PHS collaborated with Tuskegee University, a historically black college in Alabama, and began a study to record the natural history of syphilis called the Tuskegee Study of Untreated Syphilis in the Negro Male. It involved 600 black men, 399 with syphilis, 201 who did not have the disease. The participants did not provide informed consent and were told that they were being treated for bad blood, a local term used to describe several ailments, including syphilis, anemia, and fatigue. In exchange for taking part in the study, participants received free medical exams, free meals, and burial insurance. The study went on for 40 years. None of the participants who were, or who were infected or who became infected were ever told they had the disease and none were treated with penicillin even after the antibiotic was proven to successfully treat syphilis in 1945. In fact, investigators actually prevented participants from accessing syphilis treatment programs available to other residents in the area. Numerous participants died 40 wives contracted the disease, and 19 children were born with congenital syphilis. It wasn't until 1972 when a leak to the press resulted in study termination, and the study formally ended in 1973 when the surviving subjects were treated with penicillin. Here you see the classic photo for the Tuskegee syphilis study where the subjects were purportedly receiving treatment when we know in fact that the participants received no treatment for syphilis during the course of the study. So in 1974, shortly after the Tuskegee syphilis study ended, the National Research Act became law, creating the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavioral Research which in discussions about human subjects research is referred to as the commission. Then in 1976, the NIH Office for the Protection of Research Subjects created and issued its Policies for the Protection of Human Subjects, which recommended establishing independent review bodies, later called institutional review boards, or as we now call them IRBs. In 
So at this time, the national oversight entity was located at NIH, though it was later moved out of NIH as a separate office within the US Department of Health and Human Services, and is now known as the Office of Human Research Protections, or OHRP. In 1979, the Belmont Report was issued by the Commission. The members of the Commission had met in early 1976 at what was then the Smithsonian Institution's Belmont Conference Center in Elk Ridge, Maryland. This was followed by monthly deliberations of the Commission that were held over a period of nearly four years. The result was the creation of the Belmont Report, which was a pivotal event in the history of human subjects research protections. Subsequently, in 1981, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Food and Drug Administration issued regulations based on the Belmont Report. And then in 1991, the Federal Policy for the Protection of Human Subjects was published and adopted by more than a dozen other departments as agencies that conduct or fund research involving human subjects. For this reason, it is referred to as the common rule and forms the basis for protection of research subjects across these entities. So even though the regulations that form this framework were established in 1991, it wasn't until eight years later when then President Clinton apologized on behalf of the US government for the unethical and immoral research conducted under the Tuskegee syphilis study. Here are ex excerpts from the apology made to the remaining survivors or family members of study participants. So today America does remember the hundreds of men used in research without their knowledge and consent. Men who were poor and African-American without resources and with few alternatives. They believed they had found hope when they were offered free medical care by the United States Public Health Service. They were betrayed. The United States government did something that was wrong, deeply, profoundly, morally wrong. It was an outrage to our commitment to integrity and equality for all our citizens. We can look at you in the eye and finally say, on behalf of the American people, what the United States government did was shameful, and I am sorry. We commit to strengthen researchers' training in bioethics. We are constantly working on making breakthroughs in protecting the health of our people and in vanquishing diseases. But all our people must be assured that their rights and dignity will be respected as new drugs, treatments, and therapies are tested and used. I've included links to the full text and video in the references at the end of these slides if you would like to hear more about what was said. We're going to focus on the Belmont Report since this text represents the foundation of US regulations established to protect human research subjects. If you've never read it or you will be participating or conducting human subjects research, I strongly encourage you to read it. It isn't overly long and I found it to be one of the most very well written and understandable documents that you're gonna find on any US government website. The Belmont Report discussed the difference between clinical and research practice. It articulated ethical norms and obligations to subjects participating in research. And these included respect for persons, beneficence, and distributive justice. And we'll talk more about what these terms mean and how they are applied within the context of the federal regulations and IRB review of research. The Belmont Report provided the moral framework supporting our federal regulations at 45 CFR 46. And these are the regulations that govern human subjects research. I like to think of these norms and obligations as the three legs of a stool and that all three legs are needed. Respect for persons is described as acknowledging and promoting autonomy or self-determination and that there are additional protections for individuals who have diminished autonomy. Beneficence means for research, we minimize possible harms and we maximize benefits. Justice with regard to human subject research means that equals ought to be treated equally in the distribution of burdens and benefits. 
there should be a fair distribution of scarce benefits and a fair distributions of the burdens. No one principle here trumps the other. There are two sets of federal regulations to protect human subjects participating in federally supported research. We've already talked about the common rule, also referred, referred to as 45 CFR 46, but this set of regulations also includes subparts with additional regulations related to the protection of pregnant women, fetuses and neonates, prisoners, and children. Additionally, if the study includes a product that is regulated by the FDA, the federal regulations at 21 CFR for the development of new drugs, biologics, or devices also apply. The first topic that Belmont addresses are the boundaries between research and practice. The ethical obligations of researchers differ from that of clinical practitioners. There is often confusion between the roles, obligations of the researcher versus those of the clinician. Research is a class of activities designed to develop or contribute to generalizable knowledge, while clinical practice is a class of activities designed to solely enhance the well being of an individual patient. We have researchers versus practitioners. The researcher's role is to conduct research. Their primary obligation is to collect scientifically valid data, whereas the clinical practitioner's role is to provide care to their patient, and their primary obligation is to act in the patient's best interest. Ethical dilemmas and competing obligations can exist for investigators. There can be conflicts in roles, their role as a physician, their role as an investigator. There could be competing obligations. You have the obligation to the patient, the protective duty to protect the individual's well being in the face of medical burdens and the risks of research participation. And you have the obligation to science, the scientific duty to conduct the trial for which they're responsible so they can produce scientifically valid results in a timely manner so that the participation of the human subjects was not in vain. What happens when the roles are confused? We can have therapeutic misconception. This means the patient's belief that their physician would never offer non-efficacious therapy, even in the context of a research study. It's the unjustified expectation of personal benefit from participation in the study. If a patient harbors therapeutic misconception, is their consent truly informed? Responsibilities of investigators. Investigators conducting human subjects research must have knowledge of the protocol. They need to understand the various elements of the protocol. They need to understand what the protocol requires. They also need to have knowledge of ethical practices. They need to safeguard participants during the protocol. They need to safeguard confidentiality of the participants' data. They need to understand conflict of interest. They need knowledge of the informed consent process and how to communicate with the participants and their families. Investigators need to have knowledge of the relevant regulation and institutional practices. They need to understand how and why these regulations and policies actually exist. They need to understand who can obtain consent for study participation from the subjects. And they may need to understand who can give consent for research participation. The second objective that we'll now discuss relates to the purpose and function of institutional review boards and understanding the informed consent process and associated regulatory requirements. What do we mean by research? Research means a systematic investigation, including research development, testing, and evaluation, which is designed to develop or contribute to generalizable knowledge. So what makes a research project fall into the realm of human subjects research? Human subject means a living person about whom an investigator conducting research obtains information or biospecimens through intervening or interacting with the individual participant 
and uses, studies, or analyzes the information or the biospecimens. But a human subject also means that you obtain, use, study, analyze, or generate identifiable private information or identifiable biospecimens. This means that even if an investigator has no interaction with the participant, they can still be conducting human subjects research if they have access to identifiable data or specimens. Let's talk a little bit about the role of the IRB in human subjects research. The primary responsibility is to protect and safeguard the right safety and welfare of the human subjects who are participating in the research. And they do this by promoting ethical standards among investigators, peers, and the research community. The IRB provides an independent review and assessment of the potential risks and benefits of the research to human subjects. They ensure appropriate protections are in place for individuals who enroll in research studies. They confirm that the proposed research meets the regulatory requirements related to the criteria for approval of the protocol. And the IRB is to reflect the values of the local community in which the research is conducted. So what are the regulatory requirements for the IRB composition? By regulation, the IRB has to have at least five members. They need to be sufficiently qualified and diverse, diverse in terms of race, gender, professional expertise and cultural backgrounds. And they also need to be sensitive to issues such as community attitudes. They need to provide for representation for vulnerable categories of subjects such as children, prisoners, individuals with impaired decision-making capacity or economically or educationally disadvantaged persons. The IRB needs to have at least one member who is a scientific expert a non-scientific member, and it needs to have one who is not affiliated with the institution. They need to provide for expert consultations when needed. And no IRB member can participate in review of research if they have a conflict of interest with the specific research protocol. So let's review how IRBs rely on the principles of the Belmont Report in their review of human subjects research. You've seen this slide previously, but to remind you, the principles that guide the IRB as articulated in the Belmont Report include respect for persons, beneficence, and justice. With regard to respect for persons, we talk about the ethical, ethical requirements for informed consent. When we have respect for persons, potential research subjects are sufficiently informed about the study to make a knowledgeable decision about participation. Autonomy. An autonomous person is capable of deliberating about their own personal goals and of acting under the direction of such deliberation. Individuals who have diminished autonomy, we think about children or those who lack decision-making capacity. Uh, some would say that Prisoners uh, may have diminished autonomy due to the possibility of coercion. But these individuals are entitled to special protections. The federal regulations that relate to respect for persons say that informed consent must be sought from each prospective subject or the subject's legally authorized representative or LAR, unless this requirement is waived by the IRB the informed consent will be appropriately documented unless the IRB determines that no written documentation is required. The regulations speak to voluntariness and special protections. It states that when some or all of the subjects are likely to be vulnerable to coercion or undue influence, such as children, prisoners, fetuses, mentally disabled persons, or economically or educationally disadvantaged persons, Additional safeguards have been included in the study to protect the rights and welfare of these subjects. Additionally, respect for persons relates to privacy and confidentiality protections. When appropriate, there needs to be adequate provisions to protect the privacy of the subjects and to maintain the confidentiality of the data. 
Beyond what is written in regulation, we also need to consider the ethical requirements related to the informed consent process. Consent is obtained either from an adult fully capable of understanding or from the subject's legally authorized representative. Assent is obtained from a child old enough to understand and able to indicate preference for participation. And the IRB determines which children in the research study will be required to provide assent. This may be based on the child's age or cognitive function or the type of study that's being performed. If this is a study of children who are cognitively impaired, uh, the IRB may decide that assent is not appropriate. Informed consent must be legally effective and prospectively obtained with three key features, and we'll talk more about these features. It includes disclosing to the research subject the information they need to make an informed decision. It means facilitating the comprehension of the information that is disclosed. And it means promoting the voluntariness of the decision about whether or not to participate in the research. So let's talk first about the initial feature here, disclosing the appropriate information. So what does the Belmont Report tell us about providing information to prospective subjects? Belmont says, the extent and nature of information should be that such persons, knowing the procedure is neither necessary for their care, nor perhaps fully understood, can decide whether they wish to participate in the furthering of knowledge. The first step, as we noted, is providing information to the prospective subjects. The federal regulations, and uh, these regulations relate to the revised common rule. Uh, the, the common rule was updated in 2018, and these references are to the revised common rule. The prospective subject or the LAR must be provided with information that a reasonable person would want to have in order to make an informed decision about whether to participate and an opportunity to discuss that information. The prior version of the common rule did not utilize this reasonable person standard that we now have. The revised common rule also added a key information section indicating the informed consent must begin with a concise and focused presentation of the key information that is most likely to assist a prospective subject or the LAR in understanding the reasons why they may or may not want to participate in the research. There are very specific requirements as to what needs to be conveyed in the informed consent document. There must be a statement that the study involves research, needs to cover the purposes of the research, how long the, participate, the participant will be involved in the research, a description of the procedures, and they need to clearly identify which procedures are experimental. The consent form needs to describe reasonably foreseeable risks or discomforts. It needs to describe any benefits to the subjects or to others which could be reasonably expected during the course of the research. It needs to disclose what the other alternative procedures or courses of treatment would be if the individual decides not to participate in the research. It needs to have a statement describing the extent, if any, to which the confidentiality of records identifying the subject will be maintained. If the research involves more than minimal risk, there needs to be an explanation as to whether any compensation will be provided and whether any medical treatments are available if injury occurs, and if so, what they consist of or where the subject can find additional information. There needs to be an explanation of who the subject should contact for answers to their questions about the research and if they have questions about their rights as a study subject and whom they should contact in the event if they have an injury related to the research. The informed consent document must include a statement that the participation is voluntary, that if the participant decides not to be included in the study, they have no penalty or loss of benefits to them, and the subject can discontinue participation at any time, again, without any penalty or loss of benefits. A statement needs to be included as to whether the subject's data or specimens may be used for future research. 
those are the things that are very clearly required in the consent document. These are uh, items that may, be, may or may not be included based on whether it's appropriate. A statement that the particular treatment or procedure may involve risks which are currently unforeseeable. Anticipated circumstances under which the subject's participation may be terminated by the investigator without regard to the subject's consent. And this may be uh, for very good reasons if the investigator feels it's not in the individual's best interest to continue in the study. It could be that the uh, investigator is concerned about the compliance of the particular subject with the medication regimen. Uh, and if there is a non-compliance that's a concern, it could be a safety issue and that the investigator may decide to withdraw the subject based on that reason. It will include any additional cost to the subjects that could result from the participation in the research. If appropriate, it would include the consequences of the subject's decision to withdraw from the research and the procedures for orderly termination of participation. So if the subject decides they no longer want to uh, receive the study intervention, the consent form may indicate that if that's, if that's the case, the investigators would request if the subject would be willing to continue and follow up. A statement that significant new findings that are developed during the course of the research, which may relate to the subject's willingness to continue participation will be provided to the subject. Most commonly, this is done by adding the new finding to the consent form and then having the subject re-consent, re-sign the, the new consent form that has the updated information. The approximate number of subjects to be included and a statement that the subject's biospecimens, even if the identifiers are removed, may be used for commercial profit and whether the subject will or will not share in this commercial profit. And again, this would be included if it was appropriate. If appropriate, there will be a statement regarding whether the research results will be disclosed to the subjects, and if so, under what circumstances. If biospecimens are involved, whether the research will or might include whole genome sequencing. So now that we've discussed what information needs to be disclosed, how does the investigator facilitate comprehension of this information? We need to consider that the consent language be as non-technical as possible. Most IRBs strive to have the consent forms written in an eighth grade reading level. You can imagine that with some of the very complicated studies that are done on NIH, this can be a, a big challenge. There needs to be a plan for reliable translation of the consent if enrollment of a specific non-English speaking group is anticipated. There needs to be ample time and opportunity for discussion and subjects questions. It's recommended that they provi be provided with the consent form in, in advance so they have time to really read over it, discuss it with their family if they wish to, uh, craft questions that they want to discuss with the investigator during the actual informed consent process. They need to evaluate the subject's ability to understand the information as needed. Special provisions may need to be made for those with limited ability to understand. And need for assent by the participant and the consent by legally authorized representatives need to be considered. In the NIH Clinical Center, we have the Human Subjects Protection Unit. It's called the HSPU. They actually are a huge benefit to our researchers here at NIH and that they have clinical research and advocates who can administer a capacity assessment for a specific protocol. They can assist in determining if a subject who does not have the capacity to consent to the study retains the ability to assign a surrogate to make the decisions for them. They can uh, actually do consent and assent monitoring, and they can provide investigator training in the consent process. Finally, when we have provided the relevant information required by the regulations and facilitated the subject's comprehension of the material, we need to promote a voluntary decision by the subject as to whether or not they want to participate in the research. Promoting the voluntariness of the decision about whether or not to participate in research under conditions 
that are free from coercion and undue influence is the goal. Consent is only valid if voluntarily given, which requires, again, conditions free of coercion and undue influence. Coercion is when there's an overt threat of harm. It's intentionally presented by one person in order to obtain compliance from the other person. With regard to research, uh, one example might be if you have a psychology professor in your um, in the course that you're taking and that psychology professor says that um, regardless of how well you do in this course, um, you won't get an A unless you participate in my research study. That would be coercion. Undue influence, on the other hand, is when there's an offer of an excessive, unwarranted, inappropriate, or improper reward or other overture in order to obtain compliance. In this case, inducements that would ordinarily be acceptable may become undue influence if the subject is especially vulnerable. Both coercion and undue influence result in the potential subjects making choices that are not congruent with their goals, values, and interests. There's also special protections for subjects who are potentially vulnerable. Those would be those with diminished autonomy. Uh, in this category, we can think of cognitively impaired individuals who don't have the capacity to provide consent. We can think of children. Uh, in the case of pregnant women, it's the fetus that's the vulnerable entity. Prisoners, students or staff at the research site, economically, socially, educationally disadvantaged individuals, or we can potentially think about the desperately ill and dying and whether or not that impacts a subject's autonomy. Respect for persons also includes protecting privacy and confidentiality. When appropriate, the regulations say, there needs to be adequate provisions to protect the privacy of subjects and to maintain the confidentiality of the data. We need to remember that privacy is about the person and confidentiality is about the data. This third objective, we will be discussing the risk benefit assessment by the IRB and the IRB review process and criteria for approval. So we've addressed how the Belmont principle of respect for persons informs the consent process, as well as the importance of protecting privacy and confidentiality. Now let's talk about how the second Belmont principle of beneficence affects the IRB's review of research. Belmont tells us that the requirement that research be justified on the basis of a favorable risk benefit assessment bears a close relation to the principle of beneficence just as the moral requirement that informed consent be obtained is derived primarily from the principle of respect for persons. And investigators and members of their institutions are obliged to give forethought to the maximization of benefits and the reduction of risk that might occur from the research. Risk is the probability of harm related to participation in the research. And IRBs need to look at the probability of harm and the potential magnitude of harm. They do this by assessing about what is known about the disease of interest, the population that was going to be studied, and the known risks of the study interventions. Risks are not limited to physical harm, as they may also be psychological or social in nature. Potential harms exist on a spectrum. In this box here, we see harms that are low magnitude and low likelihood. In this particular box here, we see low magnitude, high likelihood. This, for example, might be a blood draw. There will be likely be pain with a blood draw. It's, that's considered relatively low, minimal risk, uh, low magnitude. But usually getting a blood draw, there's a high likelihood you will have a little bit of discomfort. Here we have high magnitude, low likelihood. In this would be, example might be a high magnitude would be death. That would be a very high magnitude harm, but it may be very, very unlikely in research. It's the research intervention says that there's uh, death is one in a hundred thousand. That would be potentially a high magnitude, but low likelihood. And then you have harms that have a high magnitude and high likelihood. These 
uh, research that has harms that are potentially high magnitude and high likelihood are not surprisingly the hardest types of research to review. So how is minimal risk defined in the regulations? For adults who are not prisoners, minimal risks means the probability and magnitude of harm or discomfort anticipated in the research are not greater in and of themselves than those ordinarily encountered in daily life or during the performance of routine, routine physical or psychological examinations or tests. And the IRB routinely categories, categorizes risks. It's either research involving no more than minimal risk to subjects, or it's in the bucket with research involving greater than minimal risk. We can certainly recognize physical risks. These are usually the easiest to identify. You can have a drug toxicity or potential exposure to ionizing radiation due to the scans required in the study, for example. You could have injuries sustained during a research-related procedure. It may receive a treatment that is less effective than the alternative. Other considerations that the risks may be unpredictable and as of yet unknown, the risk could be delayed and the harm that's caused could be irreversible. There's other types of risks, however. There's psychological risk, any psychological distress occurring as a result of participation in research. One example might be a study that is looking at adults who experienced child abuse and the questionnaires uh, that are utilized may actually result in psychological distress for the subjects. The risk could be social. And these exist where there's a possibility that the information obtained during the course of research participation could negatively impact others' perception of the participant. So if this was a uh, subject who was involved in a study of sexually transmitted diseases, uh, if this information were revealed to others, they may worry about the impact of others' perception of that individual. Risks can be legal. They can place participant at a risk of civil or criminal liability. The risks can be economic in that the participation could have a negative financial consequence on the individual. We also look at the analysis of benefit. Again, it's a risk benefit analysis. And the regulations refer to the term anticipated benefit. What are their possible benefits of participation? Are they societal and that we're obtaining generalizable scientific knowledge? Or is there anticipated benefit for the individual participant? Is there a possibility of diagnosis or improved health from participating in the study. IRBs are very careful to ensure that investigators in the consent forms do not overstate the anticipated benefit of the research. They want to avoid the risk of therapeutic misconception. And it also needs to be clear that compensation is not a benefit. What are the federal regulations that relate to beneficence? We want to know that risks to subjects are minimized as much as possible. We do this by using procedures which are consistent with sound research design and which do not unnecessarily expose subjects to risk. And whenever appropriate, we use procedures already being performed on the subjects for diagnostic or treatment purposes. The typical example is here that an individual is getting uh, clinical labs drawn and at the same time, the decision is made to collect the research samples so that you're not having to do venipuncture a second time. You can collect the research samples at the same time the clinical samples are being collected. Additional regulations and that risks to subjects are reasonable in relation to the anticipated benefits, if any, to the subjects and the importance of the knowledge that may be reasonably expected as a result of the research. In evaluating the risks and benefits, the IRB should consider only those risks and benefits that result from the research as dis distinguished from the risks and benefits of the therapies that the subject would be getting otherwise, even if they weren't participating in the research. The federal regulations say that when appropriate, 
the research plan must make adequate provision for monitoring the data collected to ensure the safety of subjects. There needs to be data safety monitoring plans and that need to be calibrated to the study risk. This can range from a formal DSMB, um, a data safety monitoring board or a data monitoring committee, which might be used for a large um, multi-site study. And these boards typically have external membership. Um, other studies that are much more low risk that are smaller studies may be fine with monitoring by the PI, but this information needs to be included in the protocol. We've covered how the Belmont principles of respect for persons and beneficence are applied to the IRB review of research. And now we turn to justice, which is that third leg of the stool, which hopefully you have that picture in your head. This principle tells us that equals ought to be treated equally and unequals unequally. It represents distributive justice in that there's a distribution of a scarce benefit. There should also be distribution of the burdens. And justice is about fairness. Individuals and groups should be neither unfairly targeted nor unfairly excluded from the research. The most important determinant of subject selection is the scientific question. We want to enroll the population, which is the best group of individuals that can answer the scientific question being asked in the research. We've covered how the Belmont principles of respect for persons and beneficence are applied to IRB review of research. And now we turn to justice, that third leg of the proverbial stool. The principle of justice is that equals ought to be treated equally and unequals unequally. We're talking about distributive justice in that there's a distribution of scarce benefit and a distribution of the burdens of the research. Justice is about fairness. Individuals and groups should neither be unfairly targeted nor unfairly excluded. The most important determinant of subject selection is the scientific question. The population enrolled should include those best able to answer the scientific question. And this is determined by the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Additional federal regulations require that the selection of subjects is equitable. And in making this assessment as to whether the subject selection is equitable, the IRB needs to take into account the purpose of the research and the setting in which the research will be taking place. And they should be particularly aware of the special problems of research that involve the vulnerable populations that we've talked about. How do we apply the principle of justice in evaluating equitable subject selection? We ask, are the inclusion exclusion criteria appropriate for the study? How are the participants being recruited? Does it suggest targeting a population of convenience? Does it miss an important population that might benefit from research participation? Does it target a population that has no chance of benefit? Is there equitable distribution of subjects based on condition being studied and anticipated benefit from the knowledge to be gained? Will those individuals being studied have access to the drug or intervention if it is efficacious? Drug testing in developing countries or in economically disadvantaged populations that effectively will not have access to it has certainly been a concern uh, in past years. Is the inclusion of vulnerable subjects justified? So where does IRB review fit into the research cycle? First, you have your protocol development. Unless this, this um, is an industry-sponsored protocol where you're actually provided with the protocol, at NIH, it's often the principal investigator that initiates the protocol. And then there's peer review and review at their branch level. The protocol must undergo scientific review to make sure that the, des the design is sound. And that is different for different institutes and centers within NIH. Uh, this process also varies uh, between various sites. Academic institutions um, vary in how they conduct scientific review. It also undergoes a conflict of interest review if, if there is 
a chance that use of the product could result in any kind of conflict of interest with those conducting the research. There's an ethics review where the IRB approval of the protocol occurs. They review the consent and the protocol describes the process for obtaining informed consent. So once the protocol is approved, there is actually a continuing review, which occurs at least once a year. Um, the revised common rule does allow for some protocols to avoid uh, that continuing review yearly, but the IRB would need to determine that that's not needed. After the approval, the initial approval, there's various safety and regulatory oversight. There's the cons ongoing consent process. The investigator needs to be reporting unanticipated problems to the IRB. Uh, certain deviations need to be reported to the IRB. If there's IND safety reports, these may need to be submitted to the IRB. If participants have complaints, the IRB is supposed to be notified about this. They need to disclose conflicts of interest. So it may be that uh, at the start of the study with a particular pharmaceutical product uh, under, under review, there were no conflicts of interest identified. But if partway during the study process, the principal investigator's wife becomes the CEO of that pharmaceutical company, there's clearly a conflict of interest uh, that needs to be adjudicated before the study, that individual can continue on the study. The, the data safety and monitoring boards or committees would be meeting as described in the protocol. And there's research summary publications and audits that are ongoing during the course of research. During the course of research, there may be amendments or changes to the protocol, the consent, or the process. These can be expedited if they're minimal risk changes. If they're greater than minimal risk, these changes are sent to the full board for review. And again, the example I gave you, if there's a new information that is detected, maybe a new risk is discovered, there would need to be changes to the protocol and the consent so that the subjects would be informed. And if there's any additional testing or evaluations that need to be done with regard to that risk, that would be uh, the change in the protocol that would also occur. So if you have your ongoing continuing review and you have now finished your research and you have finished the follow-up of all the subjects in your research, the research is considered completed. The protocol is closed, um, the IRB gives you a completion letter, and then the file is archived. So there's specific steps to the IRB submission process, and these include the principal investigator submitting the initial submission of the protocol, and then throughout the course of the protocol, they are uh, submitting their regular continuing reviews, amendments, unanticipated problems, protocol deviations, they need to submit if there's non-compliance on the protocol. And again, the informational items that can potentially impact the subject's willingness to continue in, this, in the study are reported to the IRB office. The IRB office performs pre-review to make sure that the questions are answered ahead of time that are likely to come up at the meeting. They try and make sure all the ducks are in a row before the action goes to a meeting. They prepare the agenda and the IRB chair and the analyst decides which protocol require full committee review and which are minimal risk to the, to the degree that they can receive expedited review. And the expedited reviews are done by a chair or a designated member of the IRB. Documents that the IRB members review include the study protocol, the investigator brochure, if there's an investigational product, the IRB application, the consent document, data collection instruments, recruitment materials, progress reports. So during the meeting, uh, what happens? We need to be sure that there's a quorum of the IRB members. This must include, among others, the non-scientific member of the IRB. If the numbers do not meet quorum, including a non-scientific member, the meeting cannot be held. You may have ad hoc consultants who provide expert information to the IRB, but the ad hoc consultants may not vote. The non-expedited actions are reviewed and voted on by the IRB members. The IRB 
when it's reviewing these actions, let's take, for example, a new initial review for a protocol. They can approve it unconditionally. This is very rare. More commonly, they approve it with certain stipulations. These are the changes that need to be made for the research to be approvable. They can table or defer the new protocol because it doesn't meet the criteria for approval and changes need to be made in order to meet that criteria. Or they can disapprove the protocol altogether. In this case, it might be that they don't feel that the risk benefit analysis uh, is appropriate. And they make determinations related to event reports submitted by the principal investigator. Here are hyperlinks for various references that I've mentioned during the course of, of this presentation. And thank you very much. Please feel free to email me or our office at this particular um, email address if you have any questions. Thank you.